Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. Good morning, good evening, whatever time it is for you. My name is Adam Jones. Today we are doing an absolute beast, unreal, phenomenal <laughs> marketing book called Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey A. Moore. Mate, so this concept has come up in books we've done like Start With Why, Purple Cow, and this book specifically, first written in 1989, is sort of, you can read it exclusively as building a high-tech, massive billion-dollar, multi-billion-dollar company. And if that's your goal... 100% you have to read this book. Um, but it's also widely applicable to anyone building any business and, and getting from a few people knowing about you to being mainstream. Mm, so it's yeah very applicable to just spreading ideas in general and not just, just tech. Cause mm. His goal at the start was obviously just to, to talk about how it relates to tech, but mm. definitely ideas in general. And Seth Godin talks a lot about that yes. in Purple Cow. But essentially, the big thing that happens is when you have a product or an idea early, you're going to have an early early market. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be early momentum and early wins and and people, I guess, investing a lot at the start. Mm -hmm. But then there is a big chasm, what he calls it, between the early market and then the the late market as well. Yeah, exactly. So you sort of, you might be at this point where everything's looking good. You're making some customers, making some money, getting some investment. Everything's looking up. All the numbers are going up and then you hit the chasm. And two things can happen. Either you cross the chasm effectively and become mainstream or you drop off completely die just Game become over. a just a shitty little corpse yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the you know the world of the chasm but it's like it being a hermit crab he says that has outgrown its shell so from the start the uh, you you, you kind of get a scurry to find your new home when you lose the shell from the start and it's a it's kind of like a race he has a lot of urgency mm. the way he describes it in the book definitely so with chapters one and two we're going to sort of blend and jump around a bit we're going to restructure even though the book is really well done we'll, we'll try and tweak it a little bit but anyway so essentially what the the shape is worth having a look is just a, a regular bell curve uh where you're starting from the left and moving towards the right and he divvies it, divvies it up into five sections so mm. you've got your innovators at the far left next is your early adopters next big chunk is early majority then a big chunk of late majority and then laggards yeah. at the far right. Yeah, the fuckers. The laggards. We don't want them. We don't want the laggards. But yeah, so obviously from the very start, you know, the innovators, it can be a very small percentage. Yes. And then as you go up the curve, the, the mainstream is when you start hitting your early majority and late majority. So that's where the, a lot of the population is. Yes. And that's the chasm we need to cross to get to, to be able to, you know, make the quick fortunes that he's been talking about. Exactly. So we'll start off by describing each of the five groups and then we'll get talk about the the differences between them sort of. So firstly, your innovators. So your innovators pursue new technology aggressively in that they appreciate technology for technology's sake. They want something new. They're the nerds or the techies or the propeller heads. They are willing to dive in there and work out how something works, spend hours playing around with it mm. just because they want to. Yeah, so they're not too fast if there's a few bugs or if there's a few problems with the mm. idea or, or the product or anything. They don't care too much. They want to be the first ones there and the first ones using it. So there are actually three things they that they want in, in, in summary. Uh, so I think what you're getting at is they want the truth without any tricks. Um, if they've got a technological problem, they want to speak to the technology person at the company. They don't want to speak to the salesperson. They want to talk you know, tech language um, and then they want to be first to get it and they want it cheap. Mm. So the important thing to know about them, these enthusiasts, they're like kindling. So throughout the book, he talks about the analogy of starting a fire. So at the, the start of the fire, when you're launching something, you're, you're throwing you know, your paper and your twigs and all that, but they're going to burn up really fast. So the way to, to so you need to cherish this kindling, and then the way to cherish it is to let them in on the secret, let them play with it, and implement the pr- improvements what they suggest. Yeah, nice. Um, as you said, they like they they don't even. It's not that they don't even mind about the bugs. They probably want the bugs because they want to be the first ones. They want to be the they're the innovators. Mm. Um, next, you got the uh, early adopters, who he calls the visionaries. So. Th- what they they want to be early as well, but they don't want it just for the technology. They want to see the actual reason for it. They want a compelling value proposition as to why they should use this technology and how it's going to actually help them. Mm, so they'll have a little bit of information or data from the innovators, but these ones are the taking the huge risks. So they're the you know the big companies taking these huge risks to get a kind of a quantum leap in an, in an industry. And so there's a lot mm. of risk involved with this. Um, and an example he talks about is Reed Hastings, who's the CEO of Netflix. He committed to outsourcing the computing for the entire business to Amazon. Mm. You know, this is toward the start of the company. Doing something like this, he could look like an absolute idiot. Yeah. It paid off and, you know, we're all 
Netflix and yeah. chilling on Sunday <laughs> Arvos with a with a bird in our under our arms and a bit of luck. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so what he says about these early adopters, he says that they're a rare breed of people. They have the insight to match up an emerging technology with a strategic opportunity. They have the temperament to translate this sort of high visibility, high risk project, um, and they have a charisma to get their organization to buy into the project. And what he says, they're generally sort of newer entrants into the executive ranks, highly motivated. They've probably got this big dream, this big vision to change the world, and these are the early adopters. Mm. And this can be an issue because as a buying group, they are very easy to sell to, but they're very hard to please because they've got this Mm. ridiculous big dream of what their their vision may be. And and in a lot of cases, it might actually be impossible, but you know that's what their expectations are. Yeah. So they're always also in a hurry and they're feeling the window of opportunity is closing. Cool. So we've done the innovators and the early adopters. Now, the first time he shows us the bell curve, uh, it's smooth in that it's all connected. But in reality, he redoes it and says there's cracks between each of the five sections because each of the five groups are differently. So the first crack is jumping from innovators to early adopters. It's not a massive crack, but the main difference is that the innovators are happy with just the technology whereas the early adopters need that, that reason, um, that major benefit for using it. So then the next, the next crack is really the big papa, which is what the, the book is about, and that's the difference between the early market and then the mainstream market. So this happens between the early adopters and then the early majority. Yeah, now the first crack was a little tiny little crack. This is, a, this is the chasm. This is like a fucking massive crack. Mm, and this is what a lot of people miss. And this, the big reason that there's a crack is because the psychographics between the early majority and the early adopters are completely different. You know, they're completely different people. So, so then people's early marketing plans that were working for the innovators and the early, mm. early adopters, this same marketing strategy isn't going to cut it for when you're trying to get to cross the chasm and then into the early majority. Yeah, exactly. So what the early adopters, they're looking for this change agent. So they're looking for this new technology, this new product that's going to revolutionize something. Whereas the early majority are probably more comfortable with what they're doing and they're more about a productivity improvement. They've they've seen that it's worked for these smaller guys and they need to be confident that it's going to work for the big guys as well. But he says that there's plenty of bodies in the chasm. So he talks about the Segway. The Segway was like this phenomenal technology. Like it was super impressive how the actual gyro thing inside there worked. But there was just like, there was no real compelling reason for it and it never crossed from the innovators towards the um, early majority mm. and especially because you said that stairs like as soon as you hit stairs it was game over yeah. but some of the things about the early majority is as opposed to these early adopters who are like the new guys on the block the early majority are probably like the guy who's been CEO for 20 years low on drama keeps a very low profile high on integrity high on commitment um, and he's not going to take a risk on something brand new mm, so for them you know risk is a very negative one in their vocabulary mm. and it doesn't relate to opportunity or excitement but rather a, cha- a chance to waste money and time <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly mm. um, yeah nice so Pragmatists tend to be vertically orientated, meaning they communicate with others like themselves mm-hmm. with their, within their own industry rather than the early adopters. So this is where there's a mm. big problem because it's because they don't um, speak to the early adopters to get advice. They only speak to themselves. Then, you know, it's kind mm. of a catch-22. You need to get to them first as well. Yeah, so true. And that's, a, that's yeah, exactly. That's why there's such a big chasm. And that's why it is tough to get across, but so valuable to get across if you can mm. crack that group. So he says here, you need to show up at the industry-specific conferences and trade shows that you attend. You need to have earned a reputation for quality and service. So you need to be uh, position yourself as a, as a market leader. Nice. Now, then we've got like a bit of a crack from the early majority to the late majority. Now, they're sort of equal in size, um, but the difference is that the early majority is more willing to learn how this thing can help them whereas the late majority is not. They, mm. they just want it to work. They just want to plug it in and for it to go and to be perfect. Mm. And that's so, why there's a small, just not a chasm, just a small crack between the two there. Mm. So for these people, they email rather than text. They're still on Blackberries. <laughs> <laughs> they neither tweet nor post their news and the newspaper arrives at their door and they're very <laughs> fine with just that. Thank you very much. <laughs> it says. But yeah, eventually they do succumb to the new paradigm. So they're not resistant against it yes they will eventually succumb to it if they have to kind of out of necessity yeah it's not like they're seeking out this change but if everyone else is doing it they're gonna they're not gonna resist it they're gonna jump on board whereas the laggards are going to resist it they don't want anything new they just want to stick to their old shit there's a crack there but basically 
don't give a fuck about laggards. Just forget about them completely. It's not worth the time or energy or effort or money to try and sell to them because they're small and they're useless. Mm. So the primary function of marketing to is to neutralize the influence. So these guys are the end yeah. of the thing. <laughs> so they're just going to... But there's one thing he says where you can get a huge benefit from the laggards. And rather than not try and rebut all the bad things they're saying about your product, why not explore the merits in, the, mm. in these skeptics' arguments in you know what... Because they're going to try and pick up the the difference between what you say as a company and your vision, and then actually what you're doing. So you can mm, get some true. good information from them. He says. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, that's good. Mm, love it. So, that's it. Why the chasm? So the flaw in the model that he was saying before was that there's the the model implies a smooth transition, mm. but it's it's not. And a big thing is like that you know when companies are making money early, they're making sales early. The big issue is they think, oh, we're on this big ramp. We're about to hit the hockey stick growth um, where it's just going to shoot up. We're making some good progress now. It's going to shoot up soon. But really, he says that's just a blip. That's just the early market starting to show signs. You haven't done the hard yards yet because you're about to hit the chasm um, before it truly goes mainstream. Mm. So, yeah, as we were saying before, the the big reason is the, the chasm. The pragmatists do not buy in, Do they do not reference the visionaries in their early buying decisions. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. big one, mate. So, part two of the book was Crossing the Chasm. Yeah. So, part one was all about describing the chasm and it's awesome. Um, and then part two gets real um, tactical, really technical as to if you're a company, this is exactly how you should follow it. And we'll probably, we'll be selective in what we do and don't talk about, but it's I reckon it's certainly well worth a read. Oh, 100%. So, at the start, as we were saying earlier, there's a big party. In the early yeah. markets, there's <laughs> big orders and big promises and everyone's, you know, getting wild and it's fantastic. But all of a sudden, the trend is now reversed and in the chasm, rather than accelerating mm. into cash, you're accelerating into negative cash yeah. flow. <laughs> it's basically saying it's just an absolute battle. It's a fight. Um, everyone thinks you're an invader, you're an intruder. Um, the chasm is just a bad place to be. You know, mm. it's, There's pretty much going to be no, cus- no new customers, if any, until you, cr- until you cross it. But at the same time, in there, in the chasm waiting to take you down, there's plenty of um, unpleasant folk. He says, you've got disenchanted current customers, there's nasty competitors, there's unsavory investors, which he calls vulture capitalists, who just, they just want to make money, whereas you need to not focus on money at this stage, you need to cross the chasm first. Spot on. So from here, he keeps referring to a lot of war analogies. Yes. <laughs> and what he's talking about here is the battle of Norm... The Allied invasion of Normandy on D Day, June 6, 1944. So, this is where the Allied, they had this big marketing or this big invasion. And what they did is they targeted one mm. uh, lot of beach, so, you know, securing the beachhead. And then from there, they moved on and then took over other marketing segments, yes. which is districts of France. And then on the way to total market domination, which is liberation of Western Europe. Yeah, exactly. So, rather than thinking, man, the whole of Europe is under a siege, let's tackle it all. They just focus on one beach at a time. So finding that one super small niche um, and then moving on from there. Mm. So that's the big thing. That's the, the big way of doing it. It's concentrating a overwhelmingly superior force on a highly focused target. Yes. Um, and so in, I think we're both up to chapter four where he talks about the point of attack where he sort of gives five steps. So first is you've got this whole universe of potential customers. So first, you've got to divide it up into different segments. Second, you've got to evaluate each seg- segment for attractiveness. Third, you've got to narrow down that list um, to a small number of finalists. Fourth, you need to develop estimates um, of some things like you know accessibility, distribution, degree of competition, market size. And once you've sort of got all that, uh, number five is to pick one and go after yeah, it. Yeah, so you go hard at it. Yeah. So what most companies do instead is, you know, at the start when they've got mm. all this, this early momentum, they're faced with an immensity of opportunity by the mainstream market. They lose their focus chasing every opportunity yes. that prints itself by finding themselves unable to deliver to anything true mm. to a pragmatist buyer. So the pragmatist buyer will look at all these you know, little idiots just trying to chase <laughs> everything. But you need to satisfy the payment buyer. And again, that is just focusing all your efforts onto one yes. niche category, dominating it and becoming a market leader as soon as you can. And then yeah. all of a sudden, the pragmatist buyer will start, you know, going, you know, these guys are all right. And that's a hard and fast rule. It's not around one. It's not maybe two, maybe three. It's just one. Pick one and stick to it. Um, the issue though is that it's a high risk, low data decision in that 
really like yeah you can make your estimates but really you got absolutely no idea about a whole lot of stuff and it's a big risk because picking the wrong segment the wrong niche to target um could be fatal um but that's why you need to he just he says informed intuition you need to try and get as much data as you can you're not going to get much but then use that Mm. um and go from there so the big things to consider when targeting this niche and this beachhead segment is first of all it needs to be big enough to matter Mm. small enough to win Mm -hmm. and good fit with your crown jewels yeah, what are the crown jewels? He kept referring to it, but I missed the definition of that early on. So, say if you're your north star or the or what your company is all about. Uh huh. Yes, I'm pretty nice. sure. Yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah, we'll go. <laughs> no, that sounds good enough. <laughs> so that's good, man. So the the next part of the book, which was phenomenal, was chapter six, is defining the battle. Yeah, and it's it's ridiculous if you're a new company to say, oh, we're brand new. There's nobody like us. We've got no competition. One, it's not true, and two, it's just a ridiculous belief to have mm. he says it's an issue if there's no competition then there's no <laughs> yeah. there's no mainstream market developed so then exactly then it's a really bad you know business to actually be in yeah exactly um and so what you need to do though is instead is you need to have um competition so he says that um any force can defeat any other force as long as it can define the battle mm. so it's up to you to find two competitors and say highlight them this is the competition and this is why i'm better and he says there's two planes, I guess, on which you can do this. One is product-centric and one is market-centric. So you need to find um, a product competitor. So that's a competitor where you've got a cooler product. And then a market, uh, market-centric market is based on the uh, all the different things that you can offer and saying that you're better than these guys in this aspect. So you need one where your product is better and one where your whole offering is better and mm. use them as competition. Because these pragmatic buyers, again, who are the early majority, they do not like to buy something until they can actually compare. They love to compare mm. things. So there needs to be established comp- uh, competition and an established leader to signal that the market has matured enough um, for it to be worth a product worth buying for them. Yeah, nice. And it sort of comes back to... Uh, Dan Ariely, predictably irrational, in that in people's mind, it's hard to compare. If you just say, this is me, then they have to do the work of comparing you to all their different possibilities. Whereas if you can say, hey, compared to this on scale A, we're better than this company on on this A Mm. factor. And then if you say, hey, compared to this company on, on B factor, we're actually better than this company on B factor. So you've done the hard work of identifying two companies that are similar to you, but you're better than in two different areas and you know they might actually be better than you but you get to define the whole yes. thing in the area that you're clearly the better choice yes exactly. so then in the established market you look like a, a the better choice so it's kind of manipulative and yeah and dark but it's, and yeah. dirty but it's fucking war out there that's yeah. what he's trying to the whole book it's like a war book it you is. know but it's also not you can't just like make up uh hey like hey if you compare us to facebook we're better than in this area it has to be areas that actually matter you can't just say oh we've got a better um, I don't know, this is some shit, Facebook mm. shit now anyway, but um, something else where you can just say, it can't just be random stuff, it has to be stuff that's actually important to your customer. Mm. So in the positioning process, one of the important things is, and when and this is when you're defining the battle, you need to make sure you can explain it in the time it takes to be in an elevator. You need to keep it, keep it short and brief so then it can be transmitted by word of mouth because he keeps referring into the book that pretty much all, you can't have... Um, pay for your whole marketing budget for for every lead you get. A lot of it needs to be word of mouth for you to have any any hope. So yeah, exactly. And one of the so yeah, two of the biggest aspects of word of mouth is one is having this clear three sentence um, elevator pitch, which I really like. Is some elevator pitches are shit ass, but this is a good one, which we'll go through. But the other thing is that when talking about our um, niche target market, rather than trying to get one customer across five different sections. So within each, like, like say five different niches get one customer in each, there's going to be no word of mouth effect there because even though if someone wants to tell their mate, hey, this is a really cool company, there's no one to back it up. Whereas if you go to one niche and get five customers and you've got half of the market, when someone tells their mate, they've got someone to back it up, they go to someone else, yeah, they say, yeah, these guys are really good. So obviously getting that one niche leads to that, I guess, the tipping point of word of mouth where that can take over for you mm. um, and work in your favor. Love it. 
So as you're positioning, you get to keep in, in mind what one of the goals is. You want to occupy someone's a certain segment mm. of people's brains. Yes. So for a certain category or a certain area, you need, you, you need to make sure that you're you're the, the first thing that pops up in the head. Yeah, mate. And this is... Um, does he talk about the book Positioning by Al Rees, uh, Rees and Trout? I don't mm. think he does, but we'll have to do... They, so they did a big book called 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing and they, their book before that was called Positioning. Um, which is awesome, uh, which we'll have to do at some point. Talks a lot about um, Seth Godin in the marketing seminar talks about this as well. But his sort of three-sentence structure for uh, elevator pitch is we are for this target customer, fill in the blank, who are dissatisfied with dot, dot, dot. Our product is a dot, dot, dot that provides a compelling reason to buy. Unlike this company, we've assembled dot, dot, dot. So you've got three sentences there, fill in the blanks. I reckon that's a pretty good uh, elevator pitch. Mm-hmm. Mate, phenomenal. Mate, it's a good book. And I, I don't know, reading it, I sort of went flat halfway through, but then picked up again. But it's in review. It's always better in review, but like, fuck, this is good. <laughs> mm, it is, man. <laughs> and you can shit. see why a lot of people would fail in there because mm. you can really stereotypically picture each person in, in this kind of curve. Yes. And... And you can really picture, you know, the early majority, if you can picture someone who is out, they're not going to worry about the early adopter who's jumping around and all yeah. these new things. They're not going to care about their reference. They want a reference from someone who's, you know, horizontal and just like them in yes. the early majority also. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, as, as we sort of said at the start, if you want to build a high-tech, multi-billion dollar tech company, you have to read this book. And if you want to do anything else, then I'd say probably read this book. Mm. Yeah, Mate, how good is it? Yeah. And then yet the other part, targeting the niche, like the bowling yes. pin. I don't think really talked about the bowling pin analogy, but making sure when you knock that one niche, yeah. make sure there's other bowling pins around that you can subsequently knock it over as yes. well. Yeah, exactly. No, I love it. It's really good. We sort of, um, I reckon we only covered 60% of the stuff, so it's definitely worth going. Mate, and, 30%. Th- yeah, 30%. <laughs> Go and grab this, have a read. Yeah, book. Um, yeah, and it's we haven't really mentioned this too much, but... At the bottom of each show notes or each description, you can buy, get a link which goes straight to the book. And I think we get about, what, 5% or something? Yeah, get a cents, yeah. Get a, <laughs> get a small cut. It's not a lot, but yeah. if, if you, a few of you start doing it, then we'd really you know, appreciate it because we're not getting paid for this at all. Yeah, no, I love it. Fuck yeah. Kaz time. Go to Kaz. Attend! Uh! Now listen here, ladies and gentlemen, we're going across the fucking chasm. The chasm is the difference between the early majority and then the later majority. Across the chasm, fight the war. There's a lot of dirty, dirty cunts inside the chasm that want to drag you down deep, deep into the chasm with the other bodies that are dead. Now look at those corpses there now, ladies and gentlemen, they're all dead. So you know what? They didn't choose the niche market, and they didn't. Go hard to cross the fucking chasm there, yeah, ho! Yeah, ho! Crossing the chasm, yeah, ho! If you want to light the fire, you need three things paper and kindling and logs. No matter how much paper you have, the logs won't catch on Crossing. until you get the kindling first. Now kindling! Crossing. Get that tight, tight niche, that tight, tight pussy niche, and crush, crush, crush the. Crush. Crushing the pussy now, listen here, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna go to war today! We're gonna go to war, we're gonna take the beachhead, and then we're gonna go out there and cross some more pussy from the from the countryside. The pussy on the countryside, countryside pussy.